In this video, we will be reviewing over the uh, dissection and the anatomy of the uh, mud puppy. The common mud puppy is Necturus maculosus, and it's a member of the caudata, and uh, specifically it's an amphibian. Uh, the caudata includes salamanders and newts, and they're the least specialized of the amphibians in body form and locomotion. So while we're using the mud puppy, uh, these guidelines could help with any salamander. The body typically is elongated and stout with a well-developed axle uh, muscular and tail. The salamander uses their limbs in combination with the side-to-side -side body undulation. So um, the body of the salamander is cylindrical in shape with an almost flattened underside. The body starts right after the head and is not separated by the neck. The body will stretch with an elongated tail. When we look at the head, the head um, is triangular shaped with a wide mouth and two eyes on the side of the head. They have tiny sharp teeth on their jaw border. There are no external ears in them and they have a vestigial middle ear that's present but unlikely to be seen. The limbs, they typically will have five toes on their hind limb, four toes on their forelimbs, and they do not have claws. The average size ranges between 2.5 centimeters to 20 centimeters. However, the Chinese giant sal uh, salamander can grow up to a length of about five and a half to six feet. On average, salamanders weigh between 120 grams to 200 grams. The giant salamander can weigh up to 63 kilograms. The colors can vary, as you can see on this slide, from ra uh, ranging from red, black, blue, and yellow. They can have spites, uh, spots on them and different uh, shades on their body. They are all cold-blooded. Some will have external gills. Others will have um, very simple sac-like lungs. Others still can have both gills and lungs. The salamanders tend to be nocturnal in nature. The, their diet varies, including insects, bugs, mollusks, squids, worms, larvae, and eggs. They flick out their long sticky tongue and the prey gets stuck on the tongue. The salamander will then roll their tongue back inside their mouth and eat their prey. There are predators that prey on the salamander, and so the salamanders have a few common defense mechanisms that we can see from species to species. First off, they secrete a mucus covering over their body, and this is typically a whitish mucus covering. Uh, it has a milky, poisonous fluid. It will affect the predators. They have the ability to continually regenerate their eye lenses and their retina uh, and other complex tissues in order to adapt themselves to their environment. They are able to shed off their tail in order to distract and break free from their predators. And so we can see a variety of adaptive mechanisms involved with the various salamanders. Here we have a lizard on the uh, left and we have a salamander on the right. One of the things I want to do is to explain the difference between a lizard and a salamander. Now starting off, the salamander is classified as an amphibian. They have a uh, damp skin and they secrete mucus to keep from drying out. They do not have scales, they do not have claws, they do not have any uh, external ear openings. While we look at a um, lizard, the lizard is classified as a reptile. They have a rough, dry skin with scales. They have claws on their feet and they have external ear openings. Additionally, uh, the majority of our lizards rely on sight, especially to locate prey and for communication. Our salamanders use a trichromatic color vision to locate prey. And uh, when we look at the developmental stages of a lizard versus a salamander, we will see some differences there as well. So that when a baby uh, lizard hatches, it looks like a smaller size of the adult lizard. On our salamanders, however, baby salamanders look different after hatching, and we can see that they go through a larvae, a juvenile, and finally an adult stage. And so they have to develop into what we consider the salamander after they have grown and matured. 
Now here we have some salamander eggs and the tadpoles will hatch from the eggs and they will have external gills in the wing-like forms. Uh, they will attach to either side of the head uh, just where they should have their necks and with time these tadpoles will grow and they will metamorphosize into the salamanders and those external wing-like structures will be shedded off. And while the lifespan of the salamander varies from species to species, on average salamanders will live for about 20 years and some species have even been recorded living up to 50 years. This does vary when we compare the lifespan of wild type salamanders to those in captivity. Here we have the mud puppy specimen and we can see those external gill slits. We can see that gular fold underneath the uh, what would be the neck region. We can see that we have the ventral surface here, the dorsal surface here. This would be the anterior. Here we would have the posterior. We can see the cloacal opening. We can see the femur uh, would be located in this area. And then we would have um, the brachial area up here with the humerus. Uh, so we do have a label diagram to help with some of those external structures. Now the pericardial cavity lies just anterior to the liver and it is enclosed by the pericardial sac and contains the heart. The salamander's heart is three chambered with a right and a left atria and a uh, ventricle. Now it's this ventricle that's the most uh, conspicuous part of the heart. It's the largest part of the heart. With regards to, to their respiratory system, some of our salamanders will have these external gill structures such as the mud puppy. Others will have both external gills and very simple internal um, lungs. The lungs will be described as two simple air sacs. Still, some respiration can also occur through the skin through cutaneous respiration. Also, do note that because the salamander has a heart, arteries, and veins, it has a closed circulatory system. Now here we have entered the pleuroperitoneal cavity by making a longitudinal incision and uh, we've spread the abdominal walls open and here you can see that uh, mid-ventrally uh, we have the liver and if we were to go to the posterior ventral part of the cavity we would be able to find the urinary bladder. The um, long uh, light colored tubular stomach is located right in here and it is dorsal and slightly to the left of the liver so going from the mouth we would go to the esophagus and then to the um, the stomach and then from the stomach we have the elongated spleen that's not visible here the stomach will end abruptly uh, at the pyloric sphincter and from that pyloric sphincter we would then go into the coiled intestines, that first part being the duodenum, and that would be followed by a straight large intestines. And then from the straight large intestines, we would move right down into the cloaca. And all of these organs are held in place by a thin covering of tissue known as mesentery. Now several organs and vessels are gonna lie within this region as well, and that's gonna include the pancreas, um, that would also include uh, any gonadal organs that we'll discuss. Um, the cloacal gland would be located here as well. And then um, up above, we can see where we have the, the uh, external gills and the heart. So once again, just reviewing over the anatomy, we can see the uh, three-chambered heart, the external gills. We can see the uh, straight stomach leading into the first part of the small intestines, being the duodenum the small intestines, and then following that down to the large intestines or colon, which would finally empty out into the cloaca. We can see the urinary bladder, which also um, empties into the cloaca. We can see that this is a male with testes along here. We can see the very simple air sacs that would be the lungs on this particular specimen. And we can see the very large prominent um, liver with the gallbladder associated with it. Underneath the stomach, we would have the grainy uh, pancreas. 
just one additional view of that mud puppy anatomy and in this particular one the spleen is visible where it was not uh, visible earlier we could have the uh, the stomach this pylorus is the valve that's between the stomach and the duodenum which is the first part of the small intestines again that very simple uh, air sac of the lungs the ileum is part of the uh, large intestines or the colon the gallbladder is underneath the very large uh, liver. The pancreas is the grainy gland that's underneath the stomach. And so again, just a different view of those internal organs. Finally, we move to the skeletal system of the um, salamander. And when we move to the uh, skeletal system, again, because this is a vertebrate, we will see some of this, the same bones over and over. The uh, neck vertebrae would be the cervical vertebrae. Then we have those trunk vertebrae. The sacral would be located within the hip region. And then the tail vertebrae would be the caudal vertebrae. The uh, upper leg bone is the uh, femur. And then the larger bone is the tibia. The smaller is the fibula. Then we would get into our um, tarsals and metatarsals and our phalanges. Here we have our scapula. The humerus is the upper arm bone. The radius is on the thumb side. Then we have the ulnar. We have the parietal area of the skull. The upper part of the uh, the jaw is the, ma the maxillae. The lower jaw is the mandible. We can see the ribs that are located in this area. We can see the ilium, which is part of that very simple uh, hip area. And since the salamander is a vertebrate, we will see the uh, the same bones that we would see in other vertebrates, just an apt adaptation for the lifestyle and the niche that the salamander fills.